In this next chapter, we're going to be discussing the property of small molecules known as conjugation. And before we do that, we want to talk a little bit about what we previously did with respect to simple alkenes. So we previously described the molecular orbitals of ethylene, for example, so this molecule shown, um, which contains a single uh, pi bond. So you have a single bond, a sigma bond, and a double bond, the pi bond. We have consecutive, when we have consecutive double bonds in pi systems, uh, we say that the molecular orbital description changes dramatically, and we say that the system is conjugated. And so the molecular orbital description that we have for ethylene might look something like this, where we have uh, a sigma bond in the lowest energy, pi bond, and then pi star and sigma star. Two electrons in the sigma, two electrons in the pi. If you have additional pi bonds that are strung together in longer um, systems, this molecular orbital description will change. What kinds of systems have this uh, arrangement? Conjugated systems. Uh, conjugated systems are present in anything that has resonance delocalization. So uh, something like this molecule uh, will have uh, conjugation. Uh, something like this molecule will be conjugated. Um, but there are also systems um, that are neutral that are conjugated. So just a simple benzene ring is conjugated. Uh, or, uh, as I implied earlier, if you have extended pi systems, something like uh, hexatriene, uh, you can have conjugation. Uh, so the molecules um, here um, have electrons that can spread out over multiple atoms, and so our molecular orbital description must uh, account for this. So let's dive into the simplest conjugated system, and that's uh, the allyl system. So the allyl system has conjugation spread out over three different atoms. And so there are three types of allyl systems. The first one is uh, the allyl anion. Second one is the allyl cation. And the third one is the allyl radical. And so we can draw resonance forms for each of these. And we'll use our curly arrow to denote the flow of electrons uh, in the negatively charged system. Electrons flow like this to give you a pi bond on that side. In the case of the positively charged allyl cation, electrons move like this uh, to give you positive charge on the left side. And in the case of radical, we have fish hooks, singly headed arrows, to give you the radical on the left side. All right, so this is the allyl anion, the allyl cation, and the allyl radical. And so these are allyl systems. Now, if you notice that when we did the electron movement, we never place the negative charge, the positive charge, or the radical on the central carbon atom. And so we have to ask ourselves why that's the case. Well, we need to uh, construct the molecular orbitals for this uh, pi system in order to account for this. Okay, so remember that when we're constructing molecular orbitals, we have to follow three different rules. All right, so rules uh, for molecular orbital, con molecular orbital construction. Right, the first rule we're going to follow is that for every n atomic orbitals, uh, they will combine to form n molecular orbitals. Second rule, the lowest energy molecular orbital Uh, we'll have zero nodes. So zero nodal planes. The third rule states that any increase in the energy level uh, results in additional nodal planes.
So what you'll uh, notice is that um, these allyl systems are composed of three different carbon atoms. And so if we're going to construct the molecular orbital description of a three-atom system, those uh, will be derived from three atomic orbitals. And so if we have three atomic orbitals are combining to form molecular orbitals, they're going to compute three molecular orbitals. So let's look at what this might look like for the allyl anion system. Okay, so for the allyl anion system, we have the allyl anion here. Right, we're going to draw three different molecular orbitals. The first molecular orbital is going to have zero nodes. And so I'm going to have a pi system that looks like this, in which the shading is the same on one side. And if you're thinking about the wave-particle duality uh, of the electron, here's your wave. Okay? And so we call this uh, energy level the psi 1. This would be the psi 2, and this is the psi 3. These are the uh, wave functions. As you go up, you're going to have additional nodal planes. So notice we don't have any nodal planes in psi 1. That's the lowest energy molecular orbital. In psi 2, where do we have that nodal plane? That nodal plane will be exactly at carbon uh, number 2. Right, so these are, uh, each one of these is a, a carbon atom. So carbon atom here. So we're going to have a nodal plane exactly at that carbon atom, and so we should have a wave that looks like this, which means that our shading will change as you cross the nodal plane. And so there's phasing on the top on the left and phasing on the bottom uh, on the right. And as we go up one more energy level, we should have a nodal plane again, uh, two nodal planes, this time in between the carbon atoms. And so our, uh, our wave will look like this. And of course, um, our uh, system will look like this. Notice that it resembles the size and shape of uh, the uh, psi 1. Right? These are symmetrical from top to bottom. Okay, so let's start putting some electrons in. Right? In the allyl anion system, we have four electrons total. So we're going to have two electrons in uh, psi 1, two electrons in psi 2, no electrons in psi 3. Okay, we can name these molecular orbitals. Um, psi 1 is actually the pi system. And you'll notice that in the allyl system, allyl anion system, you have a pi bond there. Um, in psi 2, we call that the pi 2, but really, it's the non-bonding energy level. So we often call this the non-bonding. And we say that it's non-bonding because we have, we've got those lone pairs uh, right there. And in psi 3, we call that the pi 3 star. That's the anti-bonding uh, orbital. And so we have a, um, a, a way to now designate which one of these uh, orbitals is the homo and way uh, to um, organize this as, as LUMO. And so we have the homo here and the LUMO here. And one last thing, we have zero nodes, one node, and two nodes, respectively, for pi 1, the non-bonding, and pi 3 star. So what you might notice is that in this molecular orbital description, the HOMO is pi 2. Right? And the coefficients are equal at the ends of the system. Right? So the electron density is found at the ends. It's never on the central carbon atom because there's a node there. Right? This node right here says that you can never have negative charge, you can never have electron density on that carbon atom in the pi system. And so when we draw the resonance, uh, we know that we can never place negative charge on that central atom. This should also tell you that if the allyl anion is reacting as a nucleophile, right, negatively charged things like to react as nucleophiles, the electrons it will use will be the homo electrons. 
And so the only atoms that have electron density in the HOMO are, homo are the ones on the ends. Okay, so this molecular orbital description basically will tell us uh, where all of the chemistry will occur, where the reactivity will occur. And so it's the same thing, same description for the allyl cation and the allyl radical. And so let's uh, try to summarize this in a, a nice table. Okay, so um, again, I'm going to have uh, psi 1, psi 2, and psi 3. The molecular orbital shapes are going to be exactly the same as we had before. All right, so shading on top for all of these in psi 1. As you cross the nodal plane in psi 2, you change the phasing, and so they're opposite. There's a node at C2. And then in the case of psi 3, the size is uh, is bigger in the middle, so it resembles psi 1, but now there are phasing changes in between each of the carbon atoms. And so if we have the allyl anion, the allyl cation, and the allyl radical, we should be able to indicate which are um, the reactive uh, homo and lumo. Okay, so in the case of... Al anion. We've got two electrons in pi one, two electrons in pi two with the non bonding, and then no electrons in pi three star. And so this is the homo, and this is the lumo. In the case of the allocation, we've got only two electrons in the pi system. And so we have the pi 1, we have the pi 2 star, and the pi 3 star. Right, the pi 2 star is also known as the non-bonding again. And so this time the homo is the psi 1, the pi 1. The lumo is the non-bonding orbital, the empty atomic p orbital that's uh, giving that system its positive charge. And so allocations al almost always react as electrophiles. And so the um, orbital that we want to put those electrons in are always going to be the LUMO this time. And then in the case of the allyl radical, this one's a little bit different. Uh, we have pi 1 here. It's got two electrons in it. We've got three electrons total, and so uh, the pi 2 has one electron in it, and then the psi 3 is just a pi 3 star. We don't have homo and lumo here because we have um, only a singly occupied molecular orbital, so we call this the SOMO, and that stands for singly occupied molecular orbital. And it's just telling you that when this thing reacts as a radical with some other radical, it's going to react via its SOMO. It's going to react via that unpaired uh, electron. Okay, so these are all systems that are symmetrical. What about uh, asymmetric systems? Systems that um, prefer, uh, don't have equal distribution of electrons. Well, the only thing that changed coefficients in the molecular orbital diagram. So what if we had this system here? So we have a, an allyl system that is no longer symmetrical, an allyl anion system, no longer symmetrical. Um, we can draw electron density moving to give us this anionic system. Now, which carbon atom do we expect to have the most electron density here? In other words, which of the pi system is more reactive? Because this is no longer a single uh, three-atom system. We have this extra methyl group on, on this side of the allyl system. Right? So our allyl system is here. Right? But because that allyl system is not symmetrical anymore, the size of the coefficients uh, will, will change. So let's just draw out uh, the, the systems again. 
And so we've got three molecular orbitals again. Uh, we still have pi 1, we still have pi 2, which is the non-bonding, and then we have pi 3 star. It's still four electrons total, so our HOMO is still going to be um, the non-bonding energy level. Our LUMO is still going to be the pi 3 star. The difference, though, will be the size of the coefficients. So now we've got this extra methyl group, so let's see what that does. And so we've got a system here in which we've got uh, the three orbitals. There's our wave. But now we've got this extra methyl group on here. And so what's that going to do? Well, it actually um, does sigma donation in the next uh, orbital. And so we're going to have a node, of course, right through the center. And as that CH, or the series of CH bonds, the, the methyl group, as that methyl group is um, delocalizing uh, into uh, the, oops, apologies, there we go, as that methyl group is delocalizing uh, into the pi system, it's going to increase the size of that molecular orbital, and the size of the coefficient. And so you've got this CH bond right here that's overlapping uh, with that atomic P orbital. So you've got sigma donation happening here. Sigma CH is overlapping with pi 2. And so because of that, you're going to increase the electron density on that carbon atom. Okay. And so this HOMO um, is going to be more reactive at C1. So I'm going to label C1 here, this is C2, and this is C3. It's going to be more reactive at C1 because it's bigger, and the HOMO itself is going to increase. Okay, so more electron density is... Um, going to be more reactive, right? The uh, transition state energy for it to react is lower. And of course, uh, when you have the pi 3 star, uh, it's going to resemble uh, what we had last time as well. Okay, so um, this is going to, um, uh, unsymmetrical systems are going to change what happens in the reactive orbital, in that pi 2 or non-bonding system, right? Turns out that the resonance form that contains the uh, negative charge on the more highly substituted carbon is more reactive because of the sigma donation into the pi system. So this will raise the coefficient on this carbon atom and make it more reactive. You're going to get better orbital overlap with an electrophile. Now there are other types of um, allyl systems as, as well that aren't um, as, um, as noticeable. And those are what allyl systems. And mass L systems are um, uh, systems in which you, you kind of have to think about um, where the electrons are, are going here. So the best example of this um, is a molecule known as uh, DMF, NN dimethyl formamide. All right, so uh, DMF has the following structure. So you've got two methyl groups here and here, All right? Um, now, um, in this particular system, this is a masked allyl system. Well, where's the allyl system? Well, we've got a pi bond here, so we know we, where that pi bond is, but we can't forget that that nitrogen atom actually has lone pairs. And so your allyl system is actually the combination of the pi bond plus the two lone pairs on nitrogen. So mast L systems normally happen when you have lone pairs on a, some sort of electronegative atom that are in conjugation uh, with uh, a pi system. Okay. So the electrons on nitrogen can delocalize into the pi system of the carbonyl to create what's known as a dipolar uh, resonance form. 
And so we can uh, draw this out. So this is a dipolar resonance form. It's a dipolar resonance form because there is a dipole. You've got a negative charge and a positively charged species. This will make this oxygen atom more basic. And it makes this nitrogen atom less basic. Right, so the oxygen is more likely to pick up a proton because it has a full negative charge in that dipolar resonance form. And the nitrogen is less basic because it's tied up into uh, the resonance form. So because we have this negative charge on the oxygen atom, uh, what we say is that that, um, that system, that, that um, allo system, is going to have more electron density on the oxygen than it will... Uh, on on the nitrogen. Now the only way this happens, the only way that we can get nitrogen to delocalize its electrons is if that nitrogen is no longer sp3 hybridized. All right? So this nitrogen is going to rehybridize as sp2 uh, then place the electrons, then place the lone pairs into the atomic p orbital. So once those lone pairs are in that atomic p orbital, they can now align with the pi CO. So overall, what this means is that in between the carbon and the nitrogen atom, we actually have a partial double bond. Remember that um, the um, true Lewis structure of a molecule is some combination of the various resonance forms that you have. And so if in one resonance form we have a single bond, and in the other resonance form we have a double bond in between the carbon and the nitrogen, uh, this tells you that um, you're going to have a partial double bond character for the carbon-nitrogen bond, and also a partial double bond character for this carbon-oxygen bond. What this also tells you uh, is that um, the two methyl groups are now in different environments. This methyl group is on the same side as the oxygen atom, whereas this methyl group is on the opposite side of the, nitrogen, uh, of the oxygen atom. And because you can't rotate around that carbon-carbon uh, uh, bond, let me draw it in red, because you can't rotate around that carbon-carbon, carbon-nitrogen carbon, uh, carbon bond, excuse me, because it's a double bond, those two methyl groups will have different signals uh, in the NMR. And so the allo system is the simplest of uh, the uh, conjugated systems. You have to look out for um, whether or not the system is symmetrical. But all of the allo systems will have the same kind of uh, shape and size for, uh, for the molecular orbital description.